Good afternoon, everyone. So happy to see you here on this rainy and blustery afternoon. Thanks for making it out. We um, are here today for our panel discussion titled Reparations Now, and are excited to hear from our, our esteemed guests on why reparations are needed and current efforts to help repair the harm done to black communities through the centuries. I'm Shauna Sherman, manager of the African American Center here at the main library. It's located on the third floor, and it's a space dedicated to celebrating and promoting the culture and history of African Americans all year round. As today is the last day of Black History Month, I wanted to mention that we will still be celebrating black history, uh, because here we call it more than a month. If you have, haven't visited the space on the third floor, please take time to do so tonight after our program or come back to the main library. We'd love to see you there. Before we get started, I wanna acknowledge that the library is located on, in the area now known as San Francisco, which is on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. As original peoples of this land, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. So we are grateful tonight, to this afternoon, to our partners for this afternoon's program, which is the Africana Studies Department of the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. Our moderator for tonight's program is Dr. Tiffany Caesar, a professor there. And before I hand the mic over to her, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction. Dr. Caesar calls herself a woman's black woman's archivist due to her ongoing research on the preservation of transnational black women leaders and engagement with public history. Queen Mother Moore, Margaret Walker, and Phyllis Nantala. Sorry. Dr. Caesar was a Mellon Scholar at the Margaret Walker Center and a faculty fellow for the Institute for Social Justice and Race Relations at Jackson State University. In addition, she has written successful grants for for the Queen Mother Moore Symposium and the 1973 Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival 50th Anniversary Prologue, Community Dialogues on Historical and Literary Methods in Creative Works for the Margaret Walker Center. In continued advocacy of pe black people's equality and civil rights, she has also written a children's book called Where Is Bobby? in response to police brutality in the United States. A recent publication is a co-authored piece entitled Mothering Dead Bodies, Black Maternal Necropolitics, which is in the fall 2022 Meridians, Feminism, Race, and Transnational Journalism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tiffany Caesar. Greetings, everyone. I kind of want to say good morning because I feel like my day is all smushed together, but welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so excited for you all to be here for this very timely discussion. And before I you know, go into my, um, my small presentation and the introduction of our wonderful panelists, I want to shout out to my students from San Francisco State University <laughs> who came today. And so um, I will just go ahead and begin. All right. So um, again, as Ms. Shauna stated, this is our kind of our cumulative um, event, Reparation Now, and this is a joint program with the African American Center at the San Francisco Public Library, as well as the Africana Studies Department in the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. I just wanna do a few reminders. Um, as the movements for African American reparation bills across the nation, we discuss the reparation movement and hear from local leaders on how they are working towards solutions to repair the harm done to our black communities. 
The discussion provides various perspectives in order to, to provide the audience with an understanding of the different activities surrounding reparations. Our panelists are political figures, academics, artists, community organizers, as well as mental health providers alike who are working at different intersections of the reparation movement. We ask that we keep in mind a spirit of unity and collaboration, though ideals may vary from participants as well as audience members. I would like to remind you all, we are here at the library, um, and here we have so many books, and I just wanted to um, name a few books on reparations that you can get here. One is From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 20, 21st Century. The other one is Should America Pay Slavery and the Raging Debate on Reparations. As well as our wonderful panelists have also written numerous articles as well as books on reparations as well as issues surrounding the black community. What is reparations? According to the United Nations, reparation refers to measures to redress violations of human rights by providing a range of material and symbolic benefits to victims or the, their families, as well as affected communities. Reparations must be adequate, effective, prompt, and should be proportional to the gravity of the violation and the harm suffered. And um, I use this definition aligned with the definition that was in the draft of San Francisco Reparation Plan. And I do believe there is some copies of that plan available. You can also find the draft of the San Francisco Reparation Plan um, online as well. I wanted to briefly mention some of the legislation that has already occurred surrounding reparation. There was the HR 40 bill. The HR 40 bill establishes the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. The commission shall examine slavery and discrimination in the colonies and the United States from 1619 to the present and recommend appropriate remedies and Congresswoman Sheila Jackson is really a major advocate nationally promoting the HR 40 bill. Recent moves towards reparations in the Bay. The San Francisco American, African American Reparation Advisory Committee and San Francisco Human Rights Commission recently submitted a reparation plan that stated a one-time lump sum payment of $5 million to be paid to each eligible person. Some of the qualifications include an individual who has identified as black African American or on public document for at least 10 years, born in San Francisco between 1940 and 1996, descendant of someone enslaved through US chattel slavery before 1865. And these are just a few. There are um, several qualifications, but I just wanted to point out a few of those. I wanted to mention that what's happening right now in San Francisco is happening globally and that this particular reparation movement or emergent and contemporary reparation movement is a part of a long history of the African American and or African descended people struggle. And I want to talk just a little bit about one of the reparation leaders, Queen Mother Moore. In 1957, she went to the United Nations with her organization, the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women, and she demanded $200 billion to be paid to African descended people for the wrongs that have been done to them due to the transatlantic slave trade. Um, Queen, Mother Mo Queen Mother Moore is born in New Iberia, Louisiana, um, July 27, 1898. She's a member of Marcus Garvey Universal Negro Improvement Association in New Orleans. Marcus Garvey is famous for his Back to Africa and Africa for African slogans. Um, she creates multiple organizations, including um, the Republic of New Africa, the African American Cultural Foundation, president of the Federation of African People. She is one of the contemporary founders of the reparation movement, and she's also an African liberation leader. So when we talk about reparation today, we're going to be talking about it from a national, a local, national, and international perspective. 
Not only was she a political advocate and founder of this now reparation movement, she also has something to say about the psychological condition of black people due to the racial traumas of slavery. Um, Queen Mother Moore, she created a, a phrase called psychosis neurosis, and she said that it's a condition that led blacks to act against their interests and engender fidelity to their oppressors. It's a form of denaturalization, othering, acting outside of oneself. Queen Mother Moore described it as a tamed lion in a circus. And throughout African American history, we have numerous psychological um, description of racial trauma that people of color go through. One I think of immediately is Dr. Joy DeGru, post-traumatic slave syndrome. Now, what brings me here, I'm coming from Jackson, Mississippi. Before Jackson, Mississippi, I was in Louisiana. And I am, I feel like it's like the South meets the West. <laughs> but I am a part of the Iberia African American Historical Society. And we are currently preserving the legacy of Queen Mother Moore. And that's where my entry of reparation comes in, is to make sure that the people who are participant and who have created the history that we we remember their names. So last year, we did a celebration in her hometown of New Iberia on July 27th. It was the first time we honored her in her city. And this summer, we're going to do a marker so that um, when people come to New Iberia, they know that it was her legacy that um, contributed towards the reparation movement and the African liberation movement overall. So I just want to show you all just a short video of what the people in the South are doing <laughs> when it comes to reparation and, and preservation. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Tiffany Caesar, and I have had the pleasure to work with the Iberia African American Historical Society on this wonderful event that we have today, which is called the Queen Mother Moore Legacy Symposium and Celebration. Thank you so much for this opportunity um, to be here to share this in uh, the place where my grandmother was born. So she wasn't the kind of grandmother that uh, made, baked cookies or took us to the zoo. I mean, she took me to Africa at age yeah. 13. the more and talk about how I got to her is that I like to talk about her as kind of the spider web that holds the black freedom movement together. Now, um, I had the opportunity to meet Queen Mother Moore when I was a young man 50 years ago <laughs> now um, um, when I was 18 years old. Come on give it to her I need it. all right I need that energy As we all do, we, we definitely stand on the shoulders of a queen. And it is for that reason that I felt I must allow Queen Mother to speak. All right. No one can tell Queen Mother Ali more a story better than Queen Mother Ali. She has a dream that one day she will be queen. Ali changed the world. And that's the, the struggle, but that's the, the goal right now, to really create an economic um, engine that could liberate us to create more jobs, more opportunities for the children.
So um, here in the garden is where I like to spend a lot of time to relax, to open up, to connect with the earth, to um, to actually be able to feed myself, to feed my family, to feed my community. So this is an important aspect of the business. Uh, just where the times that we're in right now, it's just important to grow your food and learn the process of growing food and where it comes from to uh, replenish the body. Thank you so much for allowing me to share just a little bit of how these discussions are also happening in other places nationally and what other communities are doing, just like San Francisco, to preserve African-American culture and to push forward the political movement of reparations. Now I would like to introduce our wonderful guests. And so um, I'm going to call their name and ask if they can just uh, um, come up and have a seat. And um, I'm going to read their bio. Um, the first person that I would like to introduce is Bakari Alantunje. He is the West Regional Representative for the Uhuru Movement and the Vice Chair of Uhuru Foods and Pies in Oakland. He is a longtime member and leader of the African Socialist Party. He is a part of the National Central Committee, um, the political body that compromises the top leaders of the African People's Socialist Party. And I also hear that he sells some of the best pies in Oakland. So can we give him a round of applause? The next person I would like to introduce is Brittany Chiquata. She serves as the Director of Economic Rights and the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. In this capacity, she focuses on policy and programs to build economic equity and uplift economic opportunities to improve quality of life for the most marginalized in San Francisco. Brittany has worked as a policymaker over the last decade, co-writing and co-leading successful campaigns with tangible impact locally and nationally. Can we give her a round of applause? Thank you. Um, the next person I would like to introduce is Dr. Michael Odom. He is a professor at San Diego State University. His scholarship and community work surrounds the upliftment of the black community through political organizing and education. He facilitates a podcast called Black Power Talks that profile contemporary social activists, scholars, and artists who are making a revolutionary impact in Africa and the African diaspora. He is a proud father and husband who centers his family as an important part of his life. Can we give him a round of applause? Thank you. The next person we have is Reverend Arner Townsend. He's a leading advocate for the preservation of black communities in San Francisco. He has served as a government and community relations consultant, president board of directors at the San Francisco Economic Opportunity Council, commissioner at the San Francisco Election Commission. He also was a member of the Black Student Union and participant in the 1968 student strike in San Francisco State University that led to the Karen Africana Studies as well as the College of Ethnic Studies. Last but not least, we have Ross Nyanga, who came here with his beautiful daughter. And um, he is an African-centered mental health and community worker who focuses on developing community spaces for black mental wellness. Ross is the founder of the Nyanga Consulting LLC, as well as intersections of being a life coaching. Ross has worked within the Black Bay Area community as a clinician, advocate, and community builder, builder for over 15 years. Today, Ross partners with multiple Black-owned and operated organizations committed to the improved wellness and health of the Black community in the Oakland Bay Area region. Can we give him a round of applause? All right, you all, let's talk reparations. Hey. 
Hello, can you all hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> all right, so since we are in San Francisco, the Bay Area, the first question I have for Brittany, who helped to create the San Francisco Reparation Draft Plan. And the question is, the San Francisco Reparation, African American Reparation Advisory Committee just submitted a proposal for reparations. Brittany, can you highlight the key points and the caring process in San Francisco? Sure. Um, first, thank you so much for in the invitation and for moderating today. And thank you to the San Francisco Public Library for putting on this discussion. I think it's a really wonderful use of public space and public resources. So I'm grateful um, to Director Lambert and uh, all of the amazing staff here. Um, and also just want to say thank you for uplifting Queen Mother Moore and just like the leadership of black women in this um, long history in the fight for reparations because one of the first um, legal battles that was won was by Belinda Little um, who sued for a pension, but it was essentially reparations after her enslaver died and she won. And so, you know, we have over 40 documented legal um, instances when people have sued, whether it's their enslaver or whether it's a government body, for reparations, right? So this is not novel, what we're talking about in San Francisco. I think it's really important to contextualize it in an ongoing history of black freedom fighting, because a lot of times when we talk about reparations or when we talk about um, redress, which I, I love and appreciate that you included that word, it's really about accountability. It's not a handout. It's not a payday. This is, you took a mortgage out on my back, on my ancestors, and as a descendant, I am here claiming what is due to me and what was due actually to my ancestors. And so I think it's just important that we name that this is not you know, some fallacy. There are examples um, from women who were involuntarily sterilized in North Carolina to communities in Florida that were devastated by white terrorist mobs to Japanese who were forcefully and involuntarily interned, um, including here out of San Francisco, um, of times when the government has paid reparations. This is not a new conversation. And so the role of the Human Rights Commission um, and the staff that I work with we, so we, don't, we didn't, write, we didn't you know, lead the report. We really are support staff to the committee members. So there is a 15 member body that was legislated by Supervisor Shimon Walton to create um, uh, rec recommendations in a San Francisco reparations plan. And so there are 111 recommendations that were submitted to the Board of Supervisors to the mayor's office and to the Human Rights Commission's commissioners, um, December 23rd, 2022. And the only thing that has gotten a, a lot of viral press is the one salacious recommendation for a lump sum payment of $5 million to eligible participants. And I think you know we want to emphasize that, yes, financial compensation is absolutely and rightfully a demand of both the committee and the community members who have been participating in this process for over 18 months. And it is enhanced by a broad contextual statement about the legacy of disinvestment from the city, targeting black communities, particularly through urban renewal, um, the legacy of disenfranchisement when it comes to voting, when it comes to education, when it comes to housing opportunities, and just the many ways that the city is on the record saying, when are they going home after we were solicited, after tickets were bought to lure black people here during World War II for jobs that we formerly weren't allowed to apply for. But once those were vacated by white men who'd gone off to the war, then they needed bodies and black people came to San Francisco. So I think that the committee is doing the very important work of naming and contextualizing the San Francisco damages that are due to black people and their descendants who have helped to build the city, who have been invisibilized over time, and who now you know, don't feel welcome in a city that they helped to create culturally, artistically, musically, politically. The first black studies department in San Francisco, San Francisco State, um, and so many freedom fighting movements and so many historic eras led by black people who have now been erased from that history and from that legacy. 
Thank you so much. I, I truly appreciate that all encompassing um, response and just this, this um, emphasis on the idea that this is, is not just about the money, right? It's, it's deeper. Um, it's, a, it's a long history that we need to compensate for. So thank you. Um, the next question is, it's for everybody. It's um, when we're talking about reparations, we talk about there's, there's different feelings about what reparation is. So I kind of want to just go down the line and have you all kind of personalize, like what is reparation to you? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Caesar, um, for this uh, presentation. And thank you so much for um, uh, Shauna uh, for having us here at this library, such a beautiful place here. And uh, I really appreciate what Brittany just said to open things up that, you know, um, I feel reparations is a revolutionary demand. It's not just about a monetary uh, value because uh, how can we quantify uh, in, in uh, monetary value uh, the lives of African people who've been lost, the millions of African people who lost their lives on a boat ride over here, the ones who have been worked to death to build the economy that we are presently uh, a part of now. And so we cannot quantify that, but that's not to say that we don't deserve uh, repair, that we don't deserve reparations, which we do. But what I feel reparations is, is a revolutionary uh, demand, is one that we have to raise and win the people to, to be a part of a revolutionary movement, to not just uh, uh, get redress, but to overturn a parasitic social system that was founded on the sucking the blood of the resources of people of the world, which it is maintained off of today. And until that relationship um, is overturned, it's gonna be uh, the same old thing. So for me, reparations is about overturning this social system and to being able to, for African people to feed, house, and clothe ourselves and get back to a place of being self-determined that we had prior to uh, the colonial advent um, adventure that was uh, put on African people. So I just wonder, that's what it means to me. Uh, I think that reparations is about accountability, truth, reconciliation, redress, and restitution. I think that if we were to take, you know, as some try, I think that some people won't understand reparations unless you take just like the humanity out of it. And if we were just coldly looking at it from a legal perspective, it's about damages. And, you know, when a person sues in a court of law and they prove up and down all the ways that they were targeted for discrimination, that they were harmed by the actions of someone else, how someone else made money off of their labor, how someone else continues to eat high on the hog while they do not, then not only do I get paid for that missed wage at work, but I also get pain and suffering. And so as this brother says, you can never make someone completely whole for all of the ways that we have been violated collectively, psychologically, emotionally, um, financially. But it's about putting something behind that apology and putting more into it, both in the community sense, a collective community investment, as well as damages to the individual descendants of that legacy of exploitation. Yeah, um, I'd like to appreciate everybody. Um, uh, I want to say something that might be provocative, but reparations is about a handout. But it's not about a handout to African people. It's about understanding that 600 years ago when Africa was assaulted, uh, and ever since then, a handout was given to Europe and European people. That every single thing European people have, all European people, uh, was built on the backs of African and other colonized people. So reparations is about just economic compensation to uh, for to African people, for the stolen labor, the stolen land that we have. It's about the understanding that every single thing this place has is built on the stolen labor of African people, the stolen land of indigenous people. Every I'm from San Diego. Every time I come up to Northern California or whatever, I drive and I see this beautiful place. And, and it actually makes me sad to see this beautiful place because the indigenous people that have been separated by a genocidal border um, uh, indigenous people that speak Spanish, then they call them Mexicans, or the indigenous people that 
that don't speak Spanish and they call them Native Americans, um, uh, and the African people brought over here built this well, right? Um, uh, and so, so that's what, for me, reparations is about. It's about beginning a process through which we reverse uh, the 600 years of a colonial assault against African people. Um, history, history is important as well because when we produce life, labor, and value, we are also producing history. So what has happened is African people have been robbed of our history. We've been forced to produce history, life, labor, and value for European people, even to the extent that they want to convince you that African history is American history or something like that. But I don't want to share the same history as Thomas Jefferson. But every single, but, but I also recognize the fact that there's a lot of African people walking around. There's probably more Africans named Thomas Jefferson right now than white people named Thomas Jefferson. And that is because of the history of colonial capitalism and its assault against African people, and we need to take that back. And that's what reparations is about. So $5 million ain't enough, but so I, I, I say, you know, put some zeros on it. <laughs> um, let me just say, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to build off of everything that everyone has already said. Um, there's so many different angles that you could come at this with, right? Uh, $5 million is what they might pay to one family for a police officer involved shooting for an unarmed black person, right? But now imagine that they shot your cousin and then they raped your mom and then they brutalized your uncle and then they uh, lynched your grandfather, right? And, and then you keep going and you keep going and you keep going. So like $5 million is like, you know, it, it ain't really like changing something, right? Um, one of the uh, terms that um, I've kind of started using, and I think Dr. Joy DeGruy would also agree with it, is that we don't deal with generational trauma. We, we deal with sustained trauma. Sustained trauma meaning that since the moment we engaged with Europeans within this transatlantic slave trade, which is still going on today in different ways, in many different ways. Uh, we have never stopped being traumatized. We have never stopped being traumatized. And what's interesting in the field of psychology, uh, there's this um, really sad uh, experiment that they did with this, with this dog in a cage. And they basically put it on two different panels. And what they would do is they would shock one panel and, and observe how it behaved. And then it would move to the other side of the cage and they would shock that side. And they would up the shock to higher and higher levels, and then they got to a point where they would shock both sides and see what it did. Some of you might think the dog went crazy and just wigged out. It didn't. It froze and it stayed still. And it just took the pain. And they would keep amplifying and amplifying and amplifying, and it just took it. Now, when you understand that the field of psychology was actually heavily funded by the United States government in the early 1900s, to understand how they could socially control masses of people coming from different cultures and ways of being, some of the things that they learned from was how do they impact our minds to the point where we freeze, where we become more docile and susceptible to influence and being told what to do. And so much of what we experience today is a continuation of the early research. <laughs> like it's hard to believe that our country researched how to oppress us more, right? Um, invested heavily into understanding how to oppress us and then carries it out every single day. There's a reason why when things start to go a certain way in the United States, they begin to publicize police officer involved shootings, right? It's, it's not accidental because it's been happening and it continues to happen and it'll happen more and more, but the reason why they publicize it is to shock you. Because they, they, they remember that as much, as much as they continue to shock you, the more they can keep you docile and frozen. As much as you're looking at the person who's harming you, the less you're looking at how to thrive and how to grow and how to create something where you don't have to deal with that anymore. Right? And so it keeps you in place. Right? And so when we think about what we've experienced, and then you look at five million, right? Five million? The moment you give me that money, I still gotta deal with all the embedded frameworks of how to spend money and 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 what I should have if I'm gonna be valued in this society as a black person and and then all these other different things that you've already set in place to take my money in the first place, right? 
And then there's no plan that you're actually giving me to actually find healing and actually restoration once you give me that money. So basically it just goes back into this capitalist cycle. Right? So $5 million, it's not changing our education system, it's not changing housing, it's not eliminating police violence or mass incarceration. Right? So, so we still have so much to do, even with a drop in a bucket that they might give us. And so when we think about, about reparations, it's a moment where our government has to acknowledge it. Right? And the only way that our government actually does acknowledge if things are right and wrong, which is monetarily, because it's a capitalist system, it's not humanitarian. It's not about being all you can be. It's about maximizing profit. And when it has to pay out, it sets a precedent that says, if we do this, then this. And from that, it gives us a level of freedom. And it gives us a level of power and agency within the system. And so reparations is how we're engaging with the government. But there's still a large conversation of, what do we do next? What do we do next? So, um, yeah, I think that's probably what I want to have for this. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dr. Caesar, thank you uh, for having us, uh, and, uh, or at least for inviting me. Uh, I'm already feeling like the least esteemed, but you need to hear from us too, so it's all right. Um, let, let me say a couple of things, uh, just in way of perspective, is that, uh, Number one, do you all have any idea how many white families in America have access to $5 million? And that wealth that exists would not exist without 250 years of free labor. So uh, 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 not to be difficult, but if somebody want to call it a payday, I don't have a problem. Because for 250 years, we ain't get no paydays. Not, as, as the old folks would say, not now. So consequently, uh, we're overdue, uh, number one. Number two, if you think about the labor that built this country and what it did to this nation while it was competing with Britain and France and all Germany and all the other nations in the world, they were paying somebody for their labor, even if it wasn't much. And this country was competing with free labor. And the reality is they haven't gotten over it yet because corporate America don't want to pay you nothing now. I mean, if one thinks of what you've learned just from this rail incident that happened in... Uh, 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 Palestine, they called it Palestine, uh, Ohio. And what they did to, first of all, we just had almost a major shutdown of the government because the railroads don't want to give their workers one day's paid sick leave in 2023. That's really a, a, a vestige of slavery where they just have never incorporated having to pay people decently for the work they do for corporate wealth. So um, I, I don't have a problem with that, uh, uh, with us receiving it. I don't have a problem with the number of five million because how do you put a price on 250 years 250 years, and it didn't end there. They just started calling it something different after 250 years. And still today, we still suffer from that. I just <laughs> finished a term on the uh, chairing the redistricted committee. And I brought up in our first meeting that my concern was that uh, the African American community, because you know, in San Francisco, uh, because of what y'all call gentrification, and I call modern day manifest destiny, uh, that because of that, we we're we're losing in San Francisco. And how do we strengthen our voting so folk will hear us? And even by our allies, all they told me is that if you keep on bringing race up, we're gonna sue you. Now get this, 
The reason I brought it up, we are the only population in San Francisco that is losing numbers every year. Every other ethnicity is growing. That's a vestige of slavery. That we still are last in everything. That was done. And, and most importantly, uh, I, I don't have any problem saying it's obvious that if we are going to survive as a nation, and it, 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 we've got to face the racism question, and we cannot face it. We cannot face it until we come to grips with slavery because until we come to grips with slavery, we can't come to grips with racism and what that looks like and how insidious and how it's in every institution almost every action that we take every day. As I, I, I'm reluctant to, you, as US citizens, I'm reluctant to use American because the people in South America and Canada are Americans too, and, and Mexico and you know, they're, they're Americans too. And so I, I, I don't wanna, I, I have reluctance to draft that name just for us, but that's the one we use, which shows a certain level of arrogance right there. But I, I just want us to understand that until we come to grips with it, and Americans are never going to come to grips with it, with it until it costs them some money. Because, see, when we want to say it's not about the money, yes, it is. We were brought here about the money. They wouldn't have wouldn't gotten no slave, excuse me, and ooh, let me keep, I get on young people for that all the time. They did not go to Africa and get slaves. They went to Africa and got a human being and made them slaves. And, and we, we have to start correcting that. And you see, I just slipped back into it. But the, the reality is, they wouldn't have gone over there if it wasn't about the money. And then if you, now that you've done it, and you don't want to treat us right, to, to uh, 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 quote a dear friend of mine, Bishop Yvette Flunder, if y'all didn't want to treat us right, you should have picked your own goddamn cotton. Excuse the preacher for that. But, uh, 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 and, and, and so finally, uh, we have to come to grips with it. We have to face it, discuss it, and white people got to quit faking that they so damn sensitive. That we can, have you ever seen those pictures of nine-year-old Ruby Bridges trying to go to school on her first day after Brown Boy, and she got to have Secret Service and FBI and everybody at National Guard out there walking her in the classroom at nine years old. If she can do that, then these white kids can learn about it. We must face up to it. it, it it's not going to change until we face it. And see, and, 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 and we have to pay for it. Because I'm, I'm a Christian preacher. I'm, I'm, through. I'm a Christian preacher, but let me just say this. But what I've learned in my tradition is all sin must be paid for. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, I mean, so much great just commentary on just the, the varied views, you know, and the core of reparation. I would like to ask Dr. Odom, he wanted to respond. And then just also brief. just one more thing. If I just want to add to what you're going to say. I'm just going to throw that question in. Is, um, uh, if you can also talk about who do you think should get reparations in addition to your comment? Okay, so Thanks. first off, um, I wanna say that also reparations is a way for white people to really re-enter into humanity and to overturn that. So he used the, 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 the religious aspect, so I'm pretty sure that there's some religious ways to talk about that as well, atonement and penance and things like that, but I think that sort of over and an overturning of that relationship, right? And I do think you know uh, all these problems happening are the result of a social system that is in crisis, and and the way through which things were, it's not going back to that. So you see them, you can't study Black history and all this other stuff. All that is sort of a social system in crisis. And the, you correct whenever that stuff comes up and they get told who they are, then they start playing a victim. This, 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 there's a historical basis to that. Um, so, but, but, so I think that reparations, therefore, isn't just about us versus the government. It's, a, it's not a single statistic in which African people and white people in the United States 
share the same life outcomes. Not a single statistic thing. You gotta, you gotta ask yourself why in a city like San Francisco can a white man who drops out of high school make more money than a black woman who graduates from college, right? And that's that legacy of, of, of not just slavery, but slavery instituted what we call a colonial mode of production. And that mode of production uh, sustain itself after 1865 to produce the lives that people have. But all Africans deserve deserve reparations, no matter when they came here or anything like that. I just say this, my partner is, my mother-in-law is from Bar Antigua and Barbuda. One of the largest slave plantations in Barbuda was owned by people, the people who started the Harvard Law School. And the seal itself for the Harvard Law School was the seal for this plantation. And over and over again, like this is the story all throughout the Caribbean. So you're telling me that, um, if so if those slave masters was united internationally in, a, in their attack against Africa, then African people need to be united internationally in reaping what's ours. So, so, so every single African that's here, if they got here yesterday, or their family been here since before 1865, uh, deserve reparations. Thank you. Thank that's, you so the, much. that's what was called. That's the African internationalist perspective of it, because I know that there's going to be another question about that. I mean, you got 12 questions. I don't think it's going to be. I know. This is, this is man, man, <laughs> we're not going to make them all. I have to choose. <laughs> Do anybody else want to comment on who gets reparations before I go to the next question? Because that has been something that also has been debated on, um, you know. Um, African Americans, African descended people. Uh, did anybody want to comment on that? Well, I think personally, it's just about being African. Um, you know, that African hyphen American, that hyphen is a chain that was put there. And uh, when we were taken from Africa, we were Africans. When we were dropped off at Plymouth Rock, we were Africans then. And we were Africans then, we're Africans now. Uh, when someone else determines that you're African-American, it's to their benefit. But we're Africans then, we're Africans now, so African people ourselves uh, represent a whole nation. And we're all over the planet in every time zone. Uh, we may not identify ourselves as Africans, but that's who we are. You know, so the reality is every single African on the planet deserves reparations, just like every white person is responsible um, uh, for uh, the reparations because they have benefited for hundreds of years. When I drive across this bridge from Oakland and come to San Francisco, I see all this wealth. And I think about it, if these are stolen resources, if it was not for the African slave trade, it would be no San Francisco as we know it. This is the land of the Ohlone Indians right now. And I don't know what they would have built, uh, but I do know what is built here, and I know why it was built here, I know whose expense it came after. So the reality is every African on the planet is due reparations. And it's just reparations at that. You're talking about repair, you're talking about repayment. And the thing is, this system here, this parasitic social system called capitalism, which is a colonial concoction, has to go. It cannot co, the slave and the slave master cannot peacefully coexist. And that is why the slave themselves must organize to overturn a vicious, foul social system that cannot justify itself in the eyes of real people in the real world in real time. So, Uhuru. Thank you so much. I do want to just let the audience know that we will have time for question and answers. So if you have a question, if you think of a question, please hold it. We're going to have you speak as well. So, um, Bakari, thank you so much for this explanation that reparations for all people who are African. Um, I want us to kind of get into Oakland because we are in San Francisco, but we do have some representatives from Oakland. And so my question is, um, can you talk about the assassination of the Black Panther member, Bobby Hutton, and how that and other activities led to the Bobby Hutton Free Clinic? How do we include the actions of the Black Panthers and other revolutionary organizations into the reparations discussion? Thank you, Bax, and that question. Um, Bobby Hutton was a 14-year-old young African who joined the Black Panther Party at that age. Um, it was three years later, on April 6, 1968, two days after Martin Luther King was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee. 
uh, that Bobby Hutton was murdered in Oakland, California uh, by uh, the U.S. government. And it was part of the COINTELPRO, or the counterintelligence program that some of you may know of. And it was direct attack on the African liberation movement then. Uh, and this was not an aberrancy in the history of African people fighting for freedom. Uh, the same FBI was first integrated in the 1920s, 100 years ago, to infiltrate the uh, organization of Marcus Garvey, the United Negro Improvement Association. They integrated the FBI, which was an all-white organization, brought the first Negro into the FBI to infiltrate Marcus Garvey organization. And there's a long history of United States government intervention into uh, trying to overturn genuine struggles for self-determination, not just of African people, but for colonized peoples around the world. But just getting back to the question of that, so Bobby Hutton was murdered uh, on April 6, 1968. And um, we know the history of the Black Panther Party. Um, they literally did not exist but for a few years on the ground in Oakland. Unlike the Uhuru movement that I'm a member of, the African People's Socialist Party, we've been on the ground in Oakland for 40 or more years building economic development, fighting for social justice for the African community. But the Panthers have a legacy that we've taken on. Um, Huey Newton, who was one of the founders of the Black Panther Party, was at the Uhuru House and stated himself, you may not have the Black Panther newspaper, but you have the Burning Spear. You may not have the Black Panther Party, but you have the Uhuru movement. And Uhuru means freedom in Swahili. So they haven't done anything by destroying one organization. And what we've done in, in Oakland, uh, we built the Bobby Hutton African People's Freedom Clinic. We named it after Bobby Hutton. We had a 27-foot uh, motor vehicle that we converted into a health clinic. I was a nurse who worked at Highland Hospital, and I was one of the workers on that vehicle. Well, we went in a 6-9 village in East Oakland. We went into West Oakland, into the uh, communities there the poor and impoverished community. We offered free healthcare services. We were doing fantastic work before the uh, city government of Oakland shut us down. And then they put their own red, white, and blue uh, uh, flag-waving healthcare after they shut ours down, did it for a few months, and then shut it down altogether. So the reality is we have to uh, recognize uh, who, who Bobby Hutton was. And Bobby Hutton was a freedom fighter. Bobby Hutton belonged to a revolutionary organization. He was the youngest member of the Black Panther Party at the time he joined. And he was one of the first members of the Black Panther Party murdered about a brutal military assault by the US government. And it happened right over here across the bay and many places across this country. And we carry on that legacy through the African People's Socialist Party and the Hura movement to continue the work that Bobby Hutton did, to continue the work that um, uh, uh, Huey Newton and the Black Panther Party did. We have a newspaper where we have a 14-point platform similar to what the Black Panther Party had when they had their 10-point platform. And it was about self-determination. It was about feeding, housing, and clothing ourselves and not being dependent on a system that has been sucking our blood for so long. So I know I've over-talked that, but I just wanted to, hopefully I answered the question. It was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else wanted to comment on that. Go ahead. I just want to say that um, I think it's important that we understand that the movement and the struggle for liberation, uh, it, it never started and began with just one person, but acknowledging each individual actually uh, takes us into communities and spaces where the struggle continues today. Right? Um, in Jackson, Mississippi, I believe there's um, at the Jackson Clinic, yeah, uh, where they're doing some phenomenal work. And the statement that the revolution will never be televised, right? Uh, is still true to this day. There is so much work going on, and I would encourage especially students who are kind of beginning life, right, choosing what you wanna learn, what you wanna do with your skills and your talents and your abilities, to really start thinking about what do you want to create with the legacy of your work? Because whatever you become, you have a choice of where you wanna place your talent, right? Uh, the gentleman here, he was a nurse, right, and decided to place his talent back into his community. I said, I can stay at Highland Hospital, I can go over to Kaiser, I can do some other things, or I can create something that will create change for my community. So I think it's very important that we remember the individuals who spark movements and who spark change. 
Thank you so much. Um, I am holding my comments. <laughs> um, because of what Bakari said about this ideal of um, self-determination and um, people within Oakland creating spaces for black people, right? Self-sustaining self -sustaining spaces, right? But also this legacy within American history in which when black people create organizations and institutions, they are destroyed, right? And our whole cities um, are destroyed. So one of my students um, asked this question and I felt like it was relevant just due to the comments that you all said. Um, can reparations truly be a part of integration in this land of democracy? And I wanna start with Reverend Townsend. Uh, that's a real in interesting question. Only because we've been talking about uh, reparations. Um, and I am convinced that repara what reparations can, I, I, I just said, you know, people will make their own decisions. But if reparations is only going to uh, facilitate folk buying bling, number one, that's their business of what they do with their money. It's our job to educate them on what they ought to do. But I would think that the most important thing that, for lack of a better term, the white folk have done for themselves and their control is the destruction of our communities and the economic destruction of our community. I, I, I started life in an all black town in Oklahoma. There were 28 in all, all black towns at one time. I grew up in Los Angeles and I tell young folk here, you've never been on the street where you got 30, 40, 50 black owned businesses. Like when I was a boy and we'd go over on Central Avenue and later on, uh, Western Avenue was way before we got to Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. One of the dangers for us is that if you looked at our community, what has been destroyed through urban renewal and these kinds of things are, are what I call our watering holes. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, animals come to the watering hole in the morning, not just to get water, but to get caught up on the gossip just as, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the Bible, women went to the water, women went to the well, and they talked as well as getting prepared for their duties during the daytime. And we don't see, revolution isn't created because you called a meeting to have a revolution. Revolution is created because people communicate with each other and find out they have like problems and like needs. Go ahead, you want to? Okay. No, put, put the mic up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> they have light for, you know, I'm used to hollering, so. <laughs> I, I had kids, so I, I got good at hollering. But, uh, you, you know, people have like needs. And you find out, uh, me and this brother is sitting in Nate Thurman's old restaurant, because things used to happen around there, restaurant and bar. And I started talking about my landlord doing me such and such. And you said, man, you too? That's what he said. You, and then brother is over there, sister's over there, and they hear hustling, you know. And they said, wait a minute. My landlord doing the same way. We got something going here. And now we start discussing it. Then we start discussing it. Then we might take it to the next place or to church. And if you notice, all those places in our community are being destroyed. Mm -hmm. So what reparations can do I told somebody, if you're going to buy a brain, if you're going to buy a new car, just make sure you buy them from a brother or sister. That's all. I ain't mad at that because we've got to rebuild our communities. And until, and, and, and you know, I, I'm going to say this. And I'm, I'm, my, my dream, excuse me, and maybe I'm the only one, but my dream would be if we got to respiration and all of us start getting us some boat and airplane tickets to Africa and go home and set up shop. And I want to tell you, if we all went back, if enough of us went back, 
in two years, you wouldn't even remember this place. Because everything here that we like, we'd rebuild, and everything here we wouldn't have to take with us. I was in Cuba, 1978. I was there about 18 days. World Youth Festival, uh, 66,000 people, 144 nations. Greatest party I've ever been to in my life. But I was walking down the street by myself, and we were staying at a school with the Canadians, and it was almost lunchtime, and I noticed all the different colored people sitting on the grass talking. And I stopped in my track because I realized that for the first time in eight days, I had thought about being black. And I ain't got no problem with being black. I love it. But not a day goes by that it doesn't come up to you here. It's not always unpleasant, but it's always there. But for eight days, I had been Arnold Townsend, African-American. White people don't think about being white every day. But I have to because when I leave my house in the morning, I have to leave my house armored, ready to deal with whatever is outside my door. You got to be prepared to deal with that and, 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 and reparations can begin to change that dynamic of how we think about being black in America and it will also free us that we don't even have to be in America and once we have an option on leaving, they'll be treating you a little bit different. Because they don't want that money to get out of here. So uh, I want to answer that question in the center about uh, reparations being a tool for integration. Well, it's a couple of different things. First off, I'd like to say, y'all, this the only reason why I think people can even see integration as progress is because uh, 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 they, you've been fooled to think that Africans doing for themselves is what they call separ separatism. Separatism straight up slander. That's just a slander because in 1776, when Thomas Jefferson and the rest of the slaveholders got together and said that they wanted to be to, 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 to be independent from Britain, they didn't call that the Declaration of Separatism. What did they call it? Independence. 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 So the real question is, is of independence. And to know that African independence is, 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 the, is, is, um, is the opposite of, of, of integration. So that's the important thing. The, advance, the question is, can reparations advance our cause for independence? So the next thing I'll say is that, remember, this is a, the social system is in crisis, right? First thing happens when social system is crisis, the ruling class can't rule in the same old way like they used to. So, so you all have to understand that. So what happens when the social system is in crisis is the ruling class is going to try to solve the problem yes. for itself as well. So in that situation, yes, they might try to use reparations to solve the problem of the ruling class and allowing certain elements of our group to integrate into their society. But that is the, against independence, right? That is that is to take us off the track of independence. The goal here is to is to utilize the struggle for reparations as well as other democratic rights that we that we must have as African people to push forward our cause for independence. That in itself is the difference between reparations as a tactic. Uh, uh, in the overall strategy of winning African liberation or just the end goal. If reparations is just your end goal, then, then to be honest, you'll do anything to get the reparations, even sacrifice your own freedom. And that is called opportunism. But, 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 but if it's not, if it's, if it's a way through which you are pushing for your own freedom, and so, the, so what the Reverend is saying is here, my family uh, first came from, partially from from, from from Oklahoma and Louisiana and stuff like that to South Los Angeles as well, living in Jordan in, in Jordan Downs. And 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 what uh, I'm from Long Beach. And what um what he's talking about is I, people talk about black businesses, what we need to talk about is liberated territory, yeah. right? So the thing is the, the the resources that you gain can be used to create liberated territory. And that liberated territory can be another big word, a form of dual and contending power. So that's what Bakri represents. Bakri represents an organization that is dual and contending power. The Uhuru House been there for 40 plus years on MacArthur Boulevard in Oakland from a struggle against local powers, right? So, 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 so that is liberated territory uh, organized and gained through struggle. Um, and, and sustain in some ways through the seizing of reparations. Um, if I can jump in, I really like what you're saying. The words that jumped out to me are power and independence. And so what I would challenge this student to take a step back from is 
you know, when I hear the word integration, I, br I bristle because that to me is overlaying a white standard of civilized. And oftentimes when we're talking about integration, it's integrating into a white standard and it's dishonoring the fact that black people along with every other racial identity have different standards of care, of interaction, of love, of conversation, and you know every other social um, indicator or feature that you could come up with from white people and other non-black people, and that's okay. That's how we communicate, that's how we dance, that's how we get down, that's how we moisturize in the morning. And I think that when we dishonor that the white standard, or that, that black standards are just as valid as a white standard, as a Japanese standard, as a Latinx standard, Latin A standard, that we are inherently saying, you are uncivilized, so now we're moving this barrier and you can come to this side. And so I would challenge that student to take a step back when they use that word integration, what am I integrating into? Because what was it? Um, what, uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not integrating into a burning house. And so when we talk about reparations, what we're talking about is power building for black people and independence from these systems that apply a standard that don't always fit. It's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. So let me get into my hole and you get into yours and we'll meet where we meet and that's great. Or we won't and that has to be okay too. Without equity, is just disguised. You, 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 you have a wrong in the world. And when it comes to economics, when it comes to economics uh, <laughs> and, and, and education, integration, the worst thing ever happened to us. I would also say, um, take a step back and actually ask yourself if you trust who you're trying to integrate with. Like, ask yourself, like, and not from an intellectual capacity, but like in your body, do you trust? a community that you're trying to integrate with. When you look at all the systems in place that have been uh, undermining your success and that of your family from generations, hundreds of years, having to fight for equal rights, having to fight for uh, stopping police violence, having to fight for ending mass incarceration, having to fight for access to education, having to fight, having to fight, having to fight, having to fight, and all of a sudden they say, the door is open, come on and integrate. Do you trust who you're walking through that door with? And I think that that's something that we really have to take a step back and think about. Because as the brother was saying, going to Africa, getting outside of this country's walls, I went four days without seeing a white person. Four days, not one. It changed my life. And when I realized I could walk around as a human being and not have to fight, not have to see a police car drive by and wonder if they're gonna stop and look my way, right? I can walk into a store and they're not looking at me and thinking suspiciously, having to read body language and faces. I can go into a school and not have to worry about a curriculum that's erasing my history. There's options. And I'd recommend definitely speaking to, you know, speaking to the students. If you're in your undergrad, do study abroad. Immediately, go to Ghana, go to Ethiopia, go to one of um, Brazil, definitely study abroad, get out of here for three and a half months, go to another country, and your mind, literally in psychology we learn, physiologically, your mind goes into hyperdrive, right? But it will expand how you see this world. And so when you start thinking about what you wanna fight for here, you have to ask yourself, well, where do you wanna put the resources of your energy, time, and talent? Do you want to spend, and how many years do you want to spend fighting for something that you could have for free someplace else? And so I kind of want to just throw that out there, study abroad, um, and really think about where you want to put your talent and energy. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hold my comments because I have a panel. <laughs> um, I would like to um, ask Brittany this question and also ask for um, the panelists to um, also comment if you would like. Um, due to your, your background on, on gender issues and advocating for um, women issues, I wanted to know how, how can reparations help black women's economic sovereignty 
black mothers' health care, and accessibility to equitable job and leadership opportunities. Thank you. So before I was at the San Francisco Human Rights Commission, I worked as a legislative aide and then supervisor Malia Cohen's office, who is now our first black state controller. And during my time there, it's like working at a startup for policies when you're at the Board of Supervisors and working as a legislative aide. And one thing that I have a strong passion for is black maternal health and women, black women's reproductive security. Because since we, black women, have come to this country, we have not had autonomy over our body. The things that we celebrate as far as the successes in gynecology, these were practices that were born on the bodies of black women without anesthesia, even though anesthesia was available, to try and determine the best way to solve different clinical gyneco gynecological experiments um, that still hold, a, hold uh, strong today in how black women receive treatment in hospital settings. Um, so, you know, I've worked to help secure funding for different doula projects here in San Francisco, as well as serving as a board member and a policy advisor for the Abundant Birth Project and Expecting Justice, which is the first in the nation guaranteed income program that provides um, a monthly stipend to black women and Pacific Islander women here in San Francisco from three months of um, pregnancy through one year postpartum. And for black women in particular here in San Francisco, we only are 4% of the births, but for the last 10 years, we have been 50% of the maternal mortality. And we know why that is. It's because explicitly of anti-black racism and stress in our bodies because of anti-black racism. Yes, there are employment disparities, economic disparities, but the qualifying factor across income for black women. It doesn't matter, as you were saying, whether or not you have a college, master's, PhD, JD, or no degree, um, black women have the same outcomes um, across income level. So um, the ways that I see reparations being an opportunity for uh, having an impact for um, gender justice and, and women's economic sovereignty is one, looking at a lot, I mean, I think that we were very innovative during COVID, right? So we increased the working families, um, stipends, tax stipends that families were getting. We looked at um, how, at least in San Francisco, we looked at how single parent households were accessing internet. Was it the children at home who were sharing one computer while the parent was at work and they were taking care of one another and we tried to like be really flexible and secure and uh, nimble in how we distributed funding. Um, we also paid for hotel stipends for women experiencing domestic violence so that they could have extended stays and not be sheltering in place with their abusers. And so I think that reparations is one way to look at some of those more immediate lessons. But then again, like we were saying at the top of it, looking at like the way that black women have led throughout whether we're, not talk, whether we're talking about the Black Panther Party or in the 14, 1500s to challenge white supremacy in this country, um, to fight for and elbow our space, um, elbow for our space in this conversation. So I think, you know, the decolonization or survival programs that the Black Panther Party provide a great example um, of one way that women were really at the forefront feeding children, walking them across the street to ensure that they weren't being hit by cars, and then using education as one tool to decolonize, you know, this internalized racism. One of the most powerful things, I think, of the Black Panther Party was just the social shift. Even if you weren't a member of the party, you stopped perming your hair, you started dressing differently, and you had, like, a different pride that you were able to articulate. And so I think that that mental decolonization and uh, marrying that with, you know, some of that economic independence and economic sovereignty would be one way. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just really appreciate uh, Brittany's statement. And I'm really impressed by uh, her command of what she said around the um, work of, you know, doulas. And it's a very powerful self-determination aspect that African people had always had. Mm -hmm. It's been taken from us, and I'm happy to hear the conversation about being able to bring the birth of our own children into our lives. Mm -hmm. As I said, I was a nurse, and before then, I was an ambulance driver, and I know what it's like to walk into a house and someone's in labor, and you like there have to deal with the situation, and it's real. So I can say, as a member of the African People's Socialist Party and of the Uhura Movement, 
We are um, right now have a project on the ground in St. Louis, Missouri, and it's called Black Power Blueprint. You can look it up for yourself. And right now we have a doula program mm -hmm. where we train 14 African women to uh, be able to take that on. And it just happens to be the same day that we were uh, training them, the FBI attacked our headquarters there in mm -hmm. St. Louis, Missouri on July 29th last year. Mm -hmm. We have a Hands Off Uhuru Hands Off Africa campaign. Now I have, hopefully at the end of the day, people can sign that petition to push back the government. But I'm saying all that to say is that we actually are in the process of building a women's health care center there on the ground. We built a community center and a rural house in St. Louis after Mike Brown was murdered and after the uprising of the African people there. We on the ground right now, we have in a rural foods and pies national commercial kitchen we're building out. And all of this is what we talked about earlier, dual and contending power. The thing is, we fight for power. We fight for that ability to not be dependent on the very system that sucks our blood. There's a dialectical relationship. You can't understand what's up until you know what down is. And we have to know who we are in order to know who they are to be able to overturn the system. And I just really appreciate the fact that um, we have to have our doula programs. We have to have the ability for African women to take the lead in this revolutionary struggle. And it right. has to be there because the righteous place for African women is as equals at the table by African people and not uh, at home fixing dinner and things of the sort like that, but to be as leadership. Right, Professor uh, Caesar is raised part of her life in Missouri. And it's important to note that um, in Missouri is where the African People's Socialist Party was attacked on the day that they had the African doula program in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, so many black children die every single year from that they could fill 15 kindergarten classrooms. Um, that's how many black babies die every single year. Uh, uh, so what this means is that uh, the attack against African women uh, and, uh, uh, is central to the attack against African people. Um, we talk about the theft of life, labor, and value, right? The reason why I mentioned uh, St. Louis as well is because of um, uh, there it was Dred Scott and, and Harriet Scott. You know, St. Louis gave away, the, gave them to uh, the federal government, right? So St. Louis has a long, and all these cities have a long history in collaborating. This is why San Francisco owes reparations, because these cities collaborate. You got to remember, San Francisco, when, it was right here in San Francisco that it was a base for the Confederacy. Y'all yeah. know that, right? Yeah. You know, so everyone think Malcolm said anybody live below Canada live in the South. <laughs> San Francisco was a Confederate town. Alcatraz was a Confederate base. I know this stuff. I'm a historian. So, so, right. So, 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 so the thing is that um, there was a lady named Celia Slave. Go look this up. Because not a single case in which African women, uh, uh, the rape of African women ever went punished. Not a single case. But there's a case named Celia Slave. She was outside of St. Louis. And, 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 and for over 10 years, she had been raped by her, sla her slave master. She killed the slave master. They put her to death. So the only cases you can find that have to do with any attack against African women was when African women stood up and fought in their own defense. That's why we say African women must lead, right? That's absolutely important. And African women lead from Cali House, to the other sister you mentioned, to Queen Mother Moore, all the way to the African women on this panel, to a woman named Ona Zene Yeshitela. Ona Zene Yeshitela leads the economic work of the Uhuru movement. Had drones and, and, and beams pointed at her head. And then they're going to say the Russians made them do it. Every time Africans want to do something on their own, the Russians made them do it. Ain't a single African walking around this country, United States, with Russian names. But how many of y'all walk, us walking around with slave master names? But to that point so about, about our names, you know, and the colonization of black bodies and black women's bodies in particular, the United States changed British law and what was customary to make it such that your lineage was not about your paternity. Mm -hmm. It was about whether or not your 
ma matrilineal. Woman, Elizabeth King, right? Yeah. Elizabeth King. So exactly. So so before white folks came to the United States, um, your inheritance and your status was related to your paternal your paternal side. Mm -hmm. But in order to uphold slavery in the United States, they changed the rules. So if your mother was enslaved, then you were enslaved and you were not entitled to any inheritance. So not only did that um, make the status of all children born to black women uh, mean that they were enslaved, but it essentially allowed and endorsed the raping and assault of black women. And when we talk about midwifery, black midwives were brought to the United States to help give birth to the nation, to ensure that people, that, that black, black babies survived initially. And then in the 70s, they flipped the switch and essentially bastardized midwifery as a practice, but particularly attacked black midwifery and said that, you know, you're working with outdated or uncivilized strategies. You can't be doing this, it's unsafe, it's unhealthy, even though their outcomes and rate of uh, life, um, you know, infant mortality were much lower than what was happening in the hospitals that we were just allowed to give birth in. Because right. when my grandmother was born in outside of, outside of Greenville, she wasn't born in in a hospital, not necessarily because my grandmother didn't want to, but because she wasn't allowed to. So the the line is ever moving, right? When it when it's fitting, essentially a, a capitalist end. That's also because law is really. Right, right. So, so law is just merely the opinion of the ruling class. That's what we have to understand. Uh, um, uh, uh, Nat Turner uh, was was put to death. Celia were put to death for what was right, but that's because the killing and the rape and enslavement of African people was, was legal, right? So, so I think that's precisely what you said. So, so, so law is merely the opinion of the ruling class. Yes, that's correct. So. And breaking away from slavery it was, illegal. It was illegal. Exactly. It was illegal. exactly. And, and I think one of the most significant things we have to be aware of, and, and this is real important because it leads to, you know, you all are always putting stuff on social media about Karens. The idea of Karens, when it, especially when it applies to black people, is historical. Because, well, number one, first thing white folks won't tell you is my folks never owned slaves. Well, that may be true, but every white person had complete authority over every black person. And if I'm walking down the boardwalk and it's muddy off the boardwalk and I see a white person coming towards me, I better not stop and ask them if they own slaves. I better get down in that mud and let them walk in the boardwalk. That's number one. Number two, after about 1854, when they passed the Fugitive Slave Act, you used to escape, you was free. But after Millard Fillmore, which I always find significant because the Fillmore district here in San Francisco. When Millard Fillmore was the president, they passed the Fugitive Slave Act. And that's when they put all the white folk in it. Because now, if you saw a black person and you either knew or should know that they could be an escaped slave, you were supposed to call the police, which the first police in this country was, 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 was there to hire was slave catchers because Crime and 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 all law by law by and all that was done by constables and sheriffs and marshals, not by police. Police just went out and called slaves. So to treat us the way they do is in their uh, D professional DNA. So, but what but what happened after the Fugitive Slave Act was passed? You had to turn slaves in, or you could go to jail. If you so therefore, and frequently there was a reward, so that helped. But so therefore. Understanding where we've come to now, and everybody is in on it. So quit trying to, uh, uh, one, one of the most dangerous things the white folk do, and I'm through, is that they keep trying to make, to say they wasn't a part of it, or it wasn't that bad. And I'm only saying this because I think y'all will find it funny. Somebody had on my Twitter thing, was it this morning? No, last night, they had, was said to me, was every slave owner mean and vicious? What about the kind ones? And my response was, when you attach slave owner to your name, kindness is kind of out the window after that. 
you can't talk about being a kind slave owner. Uh, George Washington had a cook, George, who was the who was the best cook ever. All the heads of state of Europe raved over his cooking, and they treated him good as a slave. And one day, all the white folk had to go somewhere, so they left George in charge because George was cool. They treated George, and uh, they all left. <laughs> they still looking for George. <laughs> when they left, George left. Yeah. And they treated him, they, they couldn't believe. Because, because self-determination, independence, should control your every thought and your every action, young folk. That's it. Young folk, if it ain't about you and us, well, pray. Yo, I love that. Um, also try to think of it in like a very real kind of circumstance. Like George left the comfort of a home that he could depend upon, a roof over his head, right? Clothes, food. He was treated well within the house, right? He had to give up something. He had, he had to give up the trappings of what maintained his uh, subservience, right, and, and his oppression. And there is a cost to trying to be free, right? Um, and so I want to I wanna leave that, especially for the young people, because there is a real cost. There is a real, hey, I just graduated and I got a job offer from this predominantly white corporation, organization who's trying to uh, get some diversity and I'm going to be the token black person. But they're going to pay me probably about $20,000 more and trying to work within my community, right? There is a cost to it. Um, it what is it worth to you? Uh, and something I would say in regards to reparations is it might be the first and only real divestment from oppression this country has ever made, if it, if it chooses to make it. Um, ending slavery, it didn't end slavery, it just transitioned into mass incarceration, right? It, 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 it transitioned to something else and it'll keep transitioning, it'll keep transitioning. Everything that they started doing when we first got here, they continue to do just with a different flavor, a different color, a different way, and it's maintaining the same thing. Today, there's more black people incarcerated than there were uh, in, in, in chattel slavery at the point of emancipation. Right? They continue to do the same thing because it is extremely profitable. And I think when people say that America is in crisis, well, if you are black in America, it is a crisis. If you're white in America, it is a damn good investment. Right? You are privileged, you are given every access point, you are given every chance, you are given the benefit of the doubt. As a matter of fact, just in case it takes time for you to work it out, we got some other people who are gonna pay the price of you trying to figure it out so that you can have every opportunity that you need. It's a great damn investment for white people. It is crisis if you are black, right? And until we start really understanding this dichotomy that it is not something that's going badly for everybody. America is not going wrong for everybody, right? When you go to Menlo Atherton, and if you haven't been there, take a drive. Have you ever seen the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the, the original show, right? And they drive, you see that big old mansion, right? Huge house, the entire block, right? And you drive over to Menlo Atherton, it's like, oh, this is a neighborhood. Oh, this, oh, this is the whole damn city here. Wait, hold on. How much money is out here? It is a damn good investment for a lot of people. And so when we start having this argument, we have to understand like when we're talking to somebody, especially who doesn't look like us, and we're saying, hey, we've got to change this, we've got to change this. Understand that your reality is not everybody's reality. And that is why you have to understand the importance of acknowledging your uniqueness, your blackness, right? Your experience, your history, self-education, right? Self-empowerment and understanding that it is not about integration, right? It's about liberation. It's about independence. It's about freedom. Thank you so much. Can we give our panelists a round of applause? I just feel like they just made my job really easy because they really just opened the conversation. Now, uh, Ms. Shauna Sherman has the mic and we would love to give the audience a time to answer, to ask questions to our, our wonderful panelists. So. So it has a lot. And what 
I'm concerned about is in that reparations report too, it says there have been other reports and basically they sit on the shelf. And um, what I get frustrated with is we have to ask permission for money. And that's how this reparations is going to happen is we have to get money from somewhere. And I'm tired of asking permission for money. Um, I, I, I worked, uh, I want to speak to the um, students here. I worked in a corporation and about five years, about three years ago, uh, the corporation started to give money to develop schools um, to help uh, schools with low income. And I told the, the, one of the high level senior vice presidents, I'm tired of waiting for it. I said, this, this, is, this is for you know, kindergarten. We gotta make changes now. I, well now, I remember 30 years ago, it was the same thing. We're gonna invest in it, it just doesn't. I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I, I want to make things happen quicker, but I don't know how, and, and, and how are we gonna fund this wonderful reparations report? Well, the difference is it has to be, be uh, that report has to be attached to a mass movement. Right, in 1982, the African People's Socialist Party held something called the First World Tribunal for Reparations to African People in the US. This was in Brooklyn, New York. For 12 consecutive years, they held uh, these tribunals, and then they hit, the most recent one was like in like the early 2000s as well. Uh, Queen Mother Moore was a member of the organization they created to take reparations out into the world, which is called the African National Reparations Organization, ANRO. Queen Mother Moore was a part of that. So the thing is, uh, the, but that reparations tribunal was 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 done with the express interest of making it a popular demand taking it out to the people, no longer simply being a legal, judicial, legislative thing, HR 40, all that stuff, cool. But the thing is, once because once it grips the masses, it becomes a material force, right? So, so, so it's gotta be, forums like this have to be held all around the city. Even going to the white community, you gotta let the people know, look, if you don't like what's going on, this is your way to get behind the right side of history. So it's gotta be taken out into the people. So the African People's Social Party created something called the African People's Solidarity Committee. When all the way back in the 1970s, when there was the Grateful Dead, they follow the Grateful Dead and sell cookies. All over the country. All over the country. Exactly, and, and, and bring that money back for development in the African community. White people, working behind the, the lines, this is what Malcolm X said, and Omalia Shetela, the leader of, of, of the Af African People's Social Party, put this into, into work with the African People's Solidarity people, white people fighting for reparations, right? So the thing is, not just in that black community here, because if it's just in the black community, it's gonna fail, right? Everybody gotta see how their freedom is tied into African people getting free. That's what it is, and, 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 and so you got to take it back. You got to win your whole community to it. That's get, how it's going to be real. Get in it, man. Get, I, I can say this, that uh, uh, we, we all know America has never expressed the love for black folks uh, that they should have, uh, but, and, and I am very convinced that during the time I was at San Francisco State during the student strike, I went to jail three times, and I believe there's of two reasons they didn't kill us out there, because they sure wanted to. We fought the police every day. Number one, the community came out, the black community. Right. The mothers, them saints like Mary Helen Rogers, uh, 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 Eloise Westbrook, the, uh, Carmen Johnson, these are names that in, in Fillmore and Baby Hunter's Point, we know, because they were saints to us. They came out. Even Ron Dellums and Cecil Williams and Dr. Carter, they came out and got arrested, number one. Number two, white students who supported us formed a white strike support committee. And they were on the picket line and fighting the police because the statute of limitations passed. My friend that used to own the Sweetwater over in Mill Valley, some of y'all know that. Uh, some of you older people might. And uh, a club over in Mill Valley, first day I ever saw in my life, he had a little old police hung up and was wearing him out. So we became friends. <laughs> I figured he was a good guy to make friends. But the point I'm saying is, because people get involved, 
things happen. And, 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 and here's what right thinking white people have to understand. Reparations is your fight too. Bringing parity and help to this country is the only thing that's going to save the country. Because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer. It ain't going to go on like this forever. The world will not stand for it. So thank you, for, one, for reading the report. And I just wanted to back up, and I, I know that I was remiss in not thanking Shauna earlier. Thank you so much, Shauna, for your amazing organization. Really appreciate you. And thank you also. I want to shout out Naomi Jelks for her work here at the library as a racial equity manager. Um, so one, thank you for reading the report because we can't say that everyone who is um, giving an opinion on, on the San Francisco reparations plan has read the report. So three things come to mind. One, um, we currently have something called the Free Minds Initiative, which is uh, free mental health opportunities for black San Franciscans. And this is culturally congruent care. And this is related to both reparations and to decades long advocacy from black community members about the problems with our current mental health offerings and what community members wanna see. So whether that's support for you and your newborn, whether that's body work, somatic, um, or psychotherapy, we are funding that. And so I would invite everyone to visit the San Francisco Human Rights Commission's page, and if you are black, sign up for that. Um, Free Minds Initiative. Uh, two, I personally believe that policy is really important because it removes the discretion um, from otherwise biased decision makers. So as much as you can uh, manage the people in charge through policy and you set guardrails and standards around that, then I think that organizing has to be coupled with policy. I think that our legal system for better or worse is what we have to work through. And so to me, it's it's, one tool in a toolbox is not a silver bullet by any means. Um, but to that end, we are having conversation at the Board of Supervisors that the Reparations Committee is leading. So March 14th, I invite everyone to please come out and give public comment because they will be voting on the draft of the San Francisco Reparations Plan. <clears throat> March, March 14th, and that's at 3 p.m. And then lastly, on the point of organizing, it is about engaging uh, communities who this is, it's about public education for communities who this isn't second nature to, who don't understand the why or who don't support the why. Um, and so we're having a number of listening sessions, the reparations committee is across the city. If you have an Apple, I invite you to pull your phone out and I will airdrop you the flyer for this Thursday at USF, 6 to 8 p.m. in Fromm Hall. We'll be having um, Professor Taylor, who's a member of the committee, uh, as well as a professor at USF, Tanish Hollins, who is the co-founder of SF Black Wall Street, and Tarika Lewis, who is the first black woman, first woman to join the Black Panthers in San Francisco, um, talking about cultural spaces and spatial justice, and really about why black people need land back, particularly here in San Francisco. Hi, my name is Nick. Uh, thank you. I want to say thank you for sharing your understanding and uh, expressing it um, and following through with it. Um, I want to ask about uh, what's the what are the mechanisms for us to continue um, your work or the work around reparations? Uh, what are the toolkits? You know, we talk about what people can do or how they can be involved, but literally, like, um, how do we put this in other people's hands so they don't forget? Um, how do they know that they can participate? Where do they send money to? Um, how do they support um, where they need to show up um, or how can they continue to do um, you know the brick and mortar things that need to help uh, as far as like you know reparations moving forward um, and then Dr. Cecil I wanted to ask as well too like we're about the uh, the ethereal aspect of, 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 of the reparations movement like um, you know Risha Muses or like you know someone who is, is coming from the spiritual perspective about how this has affected us for hundreds of years and like, you know, where are we going after this? And you know, how this is gonna take us to a place where we are healing, continuing to healing and healing the planet um, as we deal with like, you know, uh, our environment um, and, our, and the social in, the impact it's had on us. Um, 
So I, I can ask the second question. I know the first question was a toolkit, and I think someone wanted to mention about the toolkits and how do we get it to the hands of the, the community. Um, but as far as like the, the spiritual aspect of reparations, I, I look at it as um, a beginning. Um, it's, 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 I don't look at it as the only aspect, right? There are things that you know we are doing currently right, within our black communities um, and communities at large that are sustaining black people. Like we have people representing different organizations, for example, um, the Uhuru Movement, um, Oakland um, advocacies, um, like create the space. So I feel like if we as a community or as people connect with organizations that are feeding positivity positively into the community, then that will impact us spiritually because we need people. We can't create this movement without connecting to people and the, the spirit is the energy that we have in pushing the movement forward. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that. It's, uh, it's tied to the people, what was said earlier. Um, concretely, we have an Uhuru house in East Oakland. Uh, well, we have Black Power Sunday rallies every second and fourth Sundays. And that is one place to connect. We have an Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles Institution, an economic institution in Oakland that's been there 30 plus years uh, on Grand Avenue in Oakland. We have uh, the Grand Lake Farmers Market where we have a, a market booth there every Saturday. It's about economic development because we have to have our own underpinning economically. And as what um, Matt Smell had said earlier, it's about dual and contending state power. The thing that we fight for as African people is to have power over our lives. Uh, when everything else said and done is power, that is what we fight for, it is to have power over our lives and not be dependent on those who have the power over us. And we know how they got the power. What we must do is find ways to build that power and we cannot do it without going to the masses of our people. And that is connecting with them at the community center, at the economic institutions or wherever people are. If we go to people's knocking on doors to get them to join the organization or support the organization, we have to connect with real people on the ground, and that's the thing that's gonna make change, is power. And that is why in this economy, uh, a handful of people control 90% of the media. And they want to keep you deaf and dumb in terms of every news source. Everything you hear about is Ukraine. Ukraine, support the Ukraine, but you don't hear the other side of the story. So the reality is we have to go to the people and we have to connect to the people and I just wanted to end one thing I just had to say as the African People's Socialist Party, the question of reparations is real. Uh, we have on our point 11 of our 14 point platform, I just wanna read briefly. We want the US and the international European ruling class and states to pay Africa and African people for the centuries of genocide, oppression and enslavement of our people. We believe that the US and European civilization were born from and are presently maintained by the horrendous theft of human and material resources, is responsible for the present underpopulation and underdevelopment of Africa, her people, and the political servitude and impoverishment, the cultural discontin uh, discontinuity and disintegration of African people throughout the world. We believe that Africa and African people are due reparations, just economic compensation billions of dollars which must be paid to the organization of African unity or any legitimate international organization of African people for equitable um, distribution for the development of Africa. We also believe that reparations must be distributed to the various independent African states dispersed throughout the world and to the legitimate representatives of African people forcibly dispersed throughout the world who have not yet won liberation. And that's gonna come through organization and it's gonna come through understanding this system is in its last days and we gotta put it out its misery through organization. Thank you so much. Can we give our panelists another round of applause? I really would like to extend the conversation, but we are 
under a time constraint. So um, please follow up with all of our speakers on what to do next, right? And just look up different things online and follow up on the things that we kind of threw at you all um, during this panel. I would like to give um, the mic to Ms. Shauna Sherman to close the program. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Just really quick, you can follow what's happening in San Francisco at sfreparations.org. And I want to give one more hand to our panelists. What and thank you for coming. <laughs>